Welcome back to Big Talks, because we hate small talk. This is Musa and Sauda, and we're back. Hey everybody. So, today's topic is the Ringelman Effect. And I know that name may sound really weird, but it's actually something that we have probably all most likely experienced. So what is the Ringelman Effect? Okay, so just a little <coughs> back history. Um, in the early 1900s, there was a French engineer, I believe. Uh, his name was Maximilian Ringelman. I don't know if I'm saying it right or not, but <coughs> he just wanted to study how team size affects productivity in agricultural workers, right? So that was the purpose of his study. And what he did to test his study was that he used some rope pulling, very simple, easy rope pulling experiments, kind of stuff you do at like family barbecues or whatever. And he found that the more people that were pulling the rope, the less effort that the people put in. So interestingly enough, if there was one person pulling the rope, <coughs> that person pulled that rope at 100% effort, right? Um, if there were two, it kind of boiled down to like 90 something percent, three, and it kept decreasing like that, right? Um, so Wrinkleman at first was like curious. He was like, okay, <coughs> so the bigger the team gets, there's a lower worker productivity, right? Um, he thought maybe they just weren't able to coordinate with each other. But this is where things get really interesting because other people were not convinced that it was just a lack of coordination. So for the next century, lots and lots of researchers, there were at least, I want to say, 80 studies done on this, right? Um, more, more than that probably. Uh, lots of researchers wanted to look into what actually causes um, productivity loss when a team or group gets bigger. Mm -hmm. And this doesn't only have to do with work, guys. This can do with anything. This can do with like your... A group project that you did in high school English this could do with where you're working right now in your in your business or in whatever place that you work in right this can even do uh, or happen in your home <laughs> with your kids right you give your, your kids a task you have four kids or whatever you give them a task um, this can happen then as well and what they found really interestingly was <coughs> was when they tested people for rope pulling uh, they had some people actually stand in as like pretenders, right? So these people went in, they were in a groups of different numbers, differing numbers, right? And there were still people who put in less effort even when they, even when these people were pretending, right? So it wasn't, it, in that, at that point what happened was they kind of realized that it wasn't necessarily the group size that was ha that was causing this, right? It was more so people's perceptions of their group size. So like if people perceived that their group was big enough to handle the work or get the work done without them even having to do anything, right? Um, regardless of the size of the group, right? They didn't do their work. They, they just perceived that, hey, well, you know what? Someone else is going to get this job done. Right. And now as the research goes, which we'll talk about a little back and forth after I'm done explaining this, is that there are some numbers over the course of those 80 plus studies that have come up um, that have give researchers uh, that have given researchers an idea of the 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 size of groups that work best and work worst and all those things. But at the end of the day, right, this tendency to just not do something because you think or you perceive that other people in your group will get it done, that's called social loafing, right? So the Ringelman effect, AKA social loafing, is <coughs> an assignment actually that I've been working on for my MBA program recently. Mm -hmm. And I just find it a really interesting topic, especially because this week we're working in groups and we already don't have responses from two of our people. Right. Even though our group is five people, right? Um, <coughs> so, let's go ahead and talk about it. <laughs> right, yeah, actually, you know, I found that kind of interesting, um, that your assignment for school right now is basically a group assignment right after learning about the Ringelman effect. Well, actually, it's the same unit. They did this on purpose. <laughs> right, they probably did. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Just to show it off right from the get-go. Mm -hmm. But, um, that but was yeah. actually creative in my opinion yeah. because to just a sidebar to teach someone something but to actually have them experience it while you're teaching it i mean a plus for the school right <laughs> 
But yeah, I mean, it, it seems like the reason why the Ringelman effect happens is because of perception, right? Mm-hmm. So you have a group of six people. Each individual person is perceiving that we have six people working on this project. Yeah. Therefore, they don't necessarily have to pull in the same amount of weight as they would if it was only themselves. And then they reduce their productivity, right? But obviously not everybody ends up falling under that category because there has to be a group that's actually doing the work Mm -hmm. so productivity drops but some of them seem to be pulling their weight some of them don't seem to be pulling their weight and again that this seems to tie in with perception Mm -hmm. you know so um i think it's a really interesting topic especially when you tie in perception because perception is uh is uh something that we don't really account for mm-hmm. we're not naturally inclined to account for but it it's involved in everything that we do right you know <coughs> yeah def- i'm so sorry i <laughs> keep coughing <laughs> yeah it definitely is involved in everything that we do and like me and musa were before recording we were kind of talking about this topic a little bit mm-hmm. and we were trying to figure out well why does social loafing even happen right So we have a couple of theories. Well, social loving itself is still a theory, but we have a couple of theories to explain this theory, right? Mm -hmm. And so he was kind of thinking really hard about it, and I was thinking about it, and then I thought, well, you know what? Um, (coughs) What I think it boils down to is kind of like human nature, Mm -hmm. where let's say, for example... (coughs) Let's say, for example, that you have to do something by yourself. Like, you know you have no support. Mm -hmm. There's two ways that this could go. You could either just give up on yourself and give up on everything and don't even worry about it. Mm -hmm. Or you can get it done. And if you are going to get it done, then more than likely you're going to be putting in 100% of your effort. Right? So these are the people that we're talking about when they do these research studies. These people are getting the task done. For whatever reason, maybe they were compensated for the research project, Uh, maybe they just found it a really interesting task, maybe they were just curious, maybe etc, etc, whatever, right? Right. Because there also has to be a reason and a value behind doing what we do. Right. So, when you're in that position just completely by yourself, you have the choice to do or not to do, and a lot of the time, um, to to be honest with you, it, it kind of ma- leads me off this might sound a little bit off track but it kind of leads me to like how people do, would do anything to survive right um because we have that great value for our life mm-hmm. and so avoiding death is like the main thing that people kind of always try to do mm-hmm. <coughs> it's a huge of, motivator it's a huge made motivator so they would put in a hundred percent of their effort for that right mm-hmm. okay so taking that factor and assuming that the person is highly motivated to do the task more than likely they're going to put in a hundred percent some of that motivation may not necessarily be motivation intrinsically uh, or coming from themselves of valuing it it might also be just out of force right which is why it kind of brought me to the idea of someone trying to survive death um it, it might just be forced, like, well, I have to do this, otherwise, you know, X, Y, and Z is going to happen. Right, I mean, if you think about it, even, like, the whole concept behind trying to avoid death and all that, that kind of comes back to stress responses. Mm-hmm. So, we have certain responses to stress. Um, I mean, we have a whole system in our body dedicated towards how we respond to stress. Mm-hmm. But, like, on a psychological level... Um, when you're trying to avoid death, death is like a huge stressor on you. Mm-hmm. And it's that stressor that kind of pushes you to act. So, like, say, in this effect where we're talking about the Ringelman effect, we have a group of six people. Mm-hmm. The stress to get it done is, isn't is falling on one individual. The stress is dispersed among six. Yes. So now, since they're, again, perceiving less stress, they're going to react accordingly as opposed to if it's one person who has to get this one project done. Exactly. Perceiving less stress, perceiving less threat, uh, perceiving less responsibility in general. You right. you can rely on that person, right? right. Because there's, there, we can look at this from the positive angle and we could look at it from the negative angle. We could look at it from the angle of, well, you're lazy, you're a loser, you don't want to do anything, right? Or we could look at it from the angle of, instead of there now being one person 
who has to do this no matter what mm -hmm. now let's add a second person into the equation right now that same person who may still be a hard-working person who may still value whatever it is that they have to do now they see okay I have a partner I have someone that I could rely on in case I need to I have someone where I can disperse this stress I can disperse this responsibility mm. I can disperse this threat even you're stranded on an island by yourself I mean, unless you're highly introverted, maybe like me and Musa, <laughs> you're probably going to be really stressed. Um, but if you're stranded on an island with just even one other person, unless you're a cannibal or something, <laughs> or they are, okay, um, you may find that now you guys can share the responsibility. Someone goes out, looks for wood, someone, you know, not well, actually, on an island. But, well, I was maybe. actually thinking about that. I would imagine that at least initially, like... I, the reason why I brought up stress to begin with is because it's like getting into the roots of what's going on. Mm -hmm. Like when you look at the situation of like say four people stranded on an island, yeah. or like take for instance, I mean this was a fictional book, but uh, like the the Lord of the Flies, right? Mm -hmm. Lord of the Flies, a bunch of kids end up getting locked up on an island. In the beginning of the book, everybody was pulling their weight. Yeah. Because there was a high level of stress, even though you had six people there, they didn't mm -hmm. know if they were going to survive. Mm -hmm. So that high level of stress pushed them into cooperating and, and pulling their weight. But, but then over time, kids. true. But I mean, like kids, adults, the effect it typically is the same. No. So you throw in six kids in in a class project, and they're not. You're not going to see someone not pull their weight. Possibly, but I don't. I don't view kids and adults the same way. Adults have had a certain level of conditioning already to be able to predict how certain things would play out, mm. whereas kids may not necessarily have that conditioning yet. If you want something genuine, if you want something sincere, you can typically find it in a kid. All right. I mean, I guess. But the point that I was trying to make is, by the time they started organizing themselves, yeah, that's when you started seeing people falling off and not doing. Yeah. You know, people started getting lazy. Some people were okay with letting other people do things. Like, you didn't really see the Ringelman effect until after the stress of the situation died down a bit. And it actually, I guess, balanced itself out according to the situation that they're in. Everybody already got amends. Okay, we might not get off of this island. Um, we have a system in place so it's not like we're stranded like we were before and then suddenly you start seeing changes in everybody's reaction well, to the group. Well, their system was really faulty. Well, yeah, of course it was, but I mean, they didn't perceive it that way We don't want to give any spoilers on this book, but uh, <laughs> read it, because right. read it or watch the movie. But and, <laughs> and now since we've applied it to that, actually, me personally, I, I like applying things to Islam, right? Because mm -hmm. Islam... Uh, openly declares itself a complete religion yeah. and therefore it applies to every aspect of our lives therefore theories like this should should reverse engineer its way into Islam and you should be able to get some insight into it right mm -hmm. so when I looked at social loafing and I started looking into the Muslim Ummah right. as a whole right. you can actually see the Ringo Malin effect like very clearly right take from the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam during the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam there was a very small amount of Muslims Right, and then over time it grew. So in a span of like twenty three years, it started growing. And I want to avoid talking about the specifics there right now. I want to kind of just look at it in a long term sense. Okay. You had the group of Muslims. The Muslims were organized, right? The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam managed to get the entire Arabian Peninsula or most of the Arabian Peninsula together as one ummah. And then they started expanding. So they started conquering the Byzantine Empire, they started conquering the Persian Empire, they started going east, they started going west and gaining more. The quality of Muslims started decreasing over time. Yes. The group started growing. In the beginning when it was a smaller group, you had a higher quality, and then as you started going outward, you started decreasing. And right now, Islam is one of the fastest growing religions in the world. Yes. And well, right now, they? if we compare the quality of the Muslim today to the quality of the Muslim in the past... It's light years different, right? Mm -hmm. So in Islam, we always have this concept of ummah. We have this concept of the group. So everybody's aware of this concept. We're not really looking at it as a single thing. Right. But the Ringelman effect is there. Yes. You know, there's responsibilities we have. There's da'wa. There's um, taking care of our brothers and sisters, the community efforts, all that stuff. But... How, how many people are really pulling their weight in doing these things you know mm -hmm. just looking at the Muslim Ummah as an example 
the Ringelman effect is clear. And then as we're going, it seems like less and less people are pulling in their weight because now there's more people doing it, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. So applying it to that, you know, you can see the Ringelman effect clearly there. But what's even more interesting is when you look specifically at the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, right? So right off the bat, I at least think that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had a concept of this, maybe not called the, the, the social loafing, of course, because it hadn't been developed yet as a theory, but the concept would have been understood. You know? Well, this has probably existed since the beginning of time. Right. I mean, it's the human humanity has probably observed this since we started grouping up. Uh -huh. So, um, the interesting thing is how the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam addressed issues like this, right? So, when he first moved to Medina and he first established the the social order and he started getting the society built within Medina, one of the first things he did was he paired brothers. Uh -huh. Right, he would take one brother and another brother, and he would pair them together, and they became responsible for each other. Mm -hmm. Right, if the other brother had any issues or whatever, it was the the brother, his pair, that responsibility to make sure that that brother was okay. And he did this for all of the Muslims, partially because you had two groups coming in. You had the ones coming from Mecca, who were basically homeless. You know, they didn't have anything, so they're coming into Medina as like for lack of a better word, vagabonds, uh -huh. right? And then you had, you know, the established Ansar, the ones who live in Medina who are Muslim as well, uh -huh. and they had to kind of merge together in a way to, to make some kind of um, ease for both sides. But even at the same time, social order was being established. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi strategy here was to pair people together mm -hmm. to take care of each other, and that was the foundation laid for the society. Right. That everybody was put into pairs. And then when you look back at the, the Ringelman effect, w what we actually find, which I'm going to let you explain, is how the numbers actually work. And when you crunch the numbers down, the efficiency and the level of efficiency with the numbers seems to pair really well with what the Prophet ﷺ did. Yeah, I mean, the, the basic premise is the bigger the group, the less effort right. on each member. Right. right? Um, and so when we think about it in terms of pairs... In order to have any number of group, you need to have at least one more person right. than the original person, okay? And the studies show different things. I will say that there definitely are studies that show different things. There are some studies that show if the group is too small, it's ineffective. Um, however, the general premise is that if the group is too big, it's ineffective, right? I would argue that it also needs to take into account are the limitations of these studies, especially the ones that state uh, if the group is too small, it's ineffective. Um, number one, it doesn't necessarily take in the uh, into account the individual um, themselves, right? So maybe in today's society, when these studies were done, the kind of people that were being engaged in these studies, maybe that's their disposition. That's how they handled the situation. We also need to take into account the complexity of the task at hand and whatever it is that they are trying to um, assess them by using, right? Because when we're doing uh, research, we have to use certain tools. Every research has a method, right? And that method can be done in many different ways. Um, and a lot of the time when we do, um, when we do observations, we also have to take into account the, the, um, the likelihood of people, number one, skewing their results because they know that they're being observed in some way or the other, whether they know what it is that they're being observed in or not. Um, and then we also have to take into account the individual personalities of the people and such, right? Okay, so when I put that into perspective with the Prophet wasallam and the Sahaba, they know that they're being observed. However, the one that's observing them is not just some researcher. It's not someone that they don't value. They know that Allah is watching them, right? And mm. they had the greatest level besides the Prophet himself and of course all of the previous messengers and prophets, right? Of Iman and of Ihsan and that awareness that Allah was watching them. Allah was their observer, right? <laughs> uh, he, he was the one that they were performing for. Mm. I don't see any greater motivation than that to actually pull your weight. That's right. the first thing. The second thing is we have to think about their characters themselves, right? Because I mentioned that 
the limitation of a lot of these studies, especially the ones that state that the smaller the group, the more ineffective it is, right? Mm -hmm. um, is the personality and the character of the person themselves. We're talking about the best people that walk the earth, mm -hmm. right? And the Prophet ﷺ said that himself, that the best of generations were his and the one after and the one after, right? So when we put that into account, we can get an ideal model of, um, of groups, of teams, and things like that. So even though, yes, the Ringelman effect is supposedly a phenomenon that happens, that the bigger the group, um, the less efficiency, right? Um, and we see that. We see that everywhere. <laughs> I'm certain that almost everyone listening to this has experienced the Ringelman effect at some time in their life, mm -hmm. right? Um, so the fact that the Prophet wasallam at the time decided not to say, well, well, I can't grow the Ummah because, you know, it's going to eventually decrease in efficiency. That's ridiculous. But the understanding that pairing things or grouping things in small amounts, right, can build that strength at the time is just like amazing. You know, right. it's amazing to me that that's the method that he chose at that time. And of course, it's all by the wisdom of Allah, right? Um, so I find that really interesting because we do see that the greater the groups in general, the more um, the more efficiency lost, right? At the time, these were some of the best people. Now, do we know that efficiency may have been lost if the group had grown? Uh, possibly we see that throughout history, like Musa said, right? As it started expanding, you started getting different things going on. Um, even the fact that sometimes efficiency can be lost just by a lack of knowledge as well. Like, and this kind of leads me to thinking about the four medhebs, right? The, the main four medhebs, right? You have Hanafi, you have Maliki, you have Shafi, and you have um, Hanbali, right? Mm -hmm. Um, at the time, these were really good people, right? These are the, some of the greatest imams that we've ever had in Islam. But, right, let's give an example of um, Abu Hanifa, right? He had a limited access of the hadith. So a lot of his rulings were based on whatever it was that he had encountered. And every single one of, every single one of those four and all the other imams that created other medhebs during that time, which all got thrown out except for these four, they all made these statements that if there's anything other than what I'm saying that exists in the Quran and Sunnah, if it comes from the Prophet Sallallahu or Allah, right? Throw out what I'm saying and take that instead, right? So they already cleared themselves of it. I don't know why people decide that they're going to worship them nowadays, but that's a whole nother topic. <laughs> um, but the point is, as Islam started spreading outwards, as the numbers started growing, there was already this natural um, happening or this natural occurrence of that efficiency being lost. Mm. So I just think that there's many different proposals and there's many different factors that can be involved in this. And it's not necessarily that everyone just sucks and they're not pulling their weight. And I kind of wanted to point that out earlier because you mentioned that if you look across the Muslim Ummah, you will see that people don't pull their weight. And I just wanted to comment on that because A, we don't really know exactly what weight people are pulling. And B, we don't know every individual situation. So even though that general statement may not be wrong, um, we also want to make sure that there aren't any connotations in there stating that like, um, we just know somehow. Hmm. You know, because each individual situation is different, everyone is different, and we don't know people's intentions either. Can we say, and by the way, don't misinterpret that statement, because I'm not saying it doesn't matter what you do, the intention counts. Your intention counts, and what you do counts. And this is what Allah and the Prophet Wasallam taught us. Okay, so don't be fooled into thinking, it doesn't matter what I do, it's in my heart what matters. No, 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 no. <laughs> Read the Quran, learn the Sunnah from the Prophet wasallam, and then come back and make that same statement. You won't be able to. And if you do, then I don't know what exactly you were reading. <laughs> you know what I mean? But at the end of the day, people, people's situations differ. So I just wanted to add that in there because I don't want to make it seem like we are being judgmental in our speech. You know what I mean? Mm. Um, especially because part of this talk is about perception. So 
what we perceive may not necessarily be someone else's situation yeah. um and a lot of people who may seem like they're not pulling their weight even if they aren't we still don't know what's causing what's the factors that are causing that to happen you know at the end of the day the only people that we can speak for the only person that we can speak for is ourselves right right so like what i gain from this is the understanding that i need to pull my weight in other words you know right. yeah regardless definitely. of how big the group is i mean when it comes to application of it definitely um because it's a phenomenon that happens right it, seem, mm -hmm. it seems like this just, just what ends up happening and that's the interesting thing about science science kind of requires that there's certain foundations in line certain mm -hmm. commonalities or not commonalities but like certain um, consistencies mm -hmm. right and for there to be a consistency like this within humanity mm -hmm. there's something in human nature mm -hmm. that has to be consistent amongst everybody for us to see phenomena like this you know but um yeah the the thing i kind of wanted to talk about a little earlier when i was trying to pass it over was like the numbers right so when you actually get into the numbers of Ringelman's pulling experiment, you know, what they found was that uh, when one person's pulling their weight, you can expect like 100% effort. When two people are tied together to do something, you can expect roughly 92, 93%, I think it was. Then when you start getting to three, suddenly there's a, a bigger drop down to like 85. And then as it goes down four, you're in like the 70s, five, you're in like still in the 70s but moving towards the 60s you know like there's a sudden decrease but at two you know if you think about it in the sense of like grading right 100 percent and 90 percent they're both a's right once you get into the 80 percent range now you're getting into a b and your grade's actually changing right so there's a, a a pretty big difference between three and one but between two and one there isn't that big of a difference and then when you look at the strategy of the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he would pair people together mm -hmm. that was his strategy pair 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 that was the foundation he built the muslim ummah on was to pair these brothers together so efficiency if you look at it from that angle it's almost as if he anticipated you know loss of, of, of uh, efficiency like right from the get-go right. when he's trying to build everything so he paired things because he could have made it three, he could have made it four. Which is why we're kind of tying this into human nature and this this understanding of something in the human that um, inclines us already toward these kinds of dispositions. Um, but there is the possibility of people who don't necessarily fall to this inclination right um and so interestingly the research shows uh something it's a concept called social compensation right um and it's kind of the after effect of social loafing right which is when people now based on their perception of let's say there's a group of six right um and in the beginning all six people are tasked to do something and three people in the group, like you had mentioned earlier when we were talking about this, uh, three people in the group decide that, well, there's six people to do this task. We don't really need to do anything. These other three people will get it done, right? right. That's the social loafing. Now, the three people who have actually been working this whole time, now their perception is going to change, and they're going to look at the three people who are slacking off and say, these people are incompetent and unreliable. Right. So we have to now overcompensate for whatever it is that they're not doing. Right. And that's how social compensation uh, ensues, right? Where a certain number of people in the group decide that they're going to overperform and the productivity of the group is not necessarily lost. Right, okay? yeah. And again, that ties back into perception because mm -hmm. um, you had an initial perception, right? The initial perception was all six people looked at the group and they saw that there are six of us to do this one task we don't need to pull our weight nearly as much mm -hmm. now when people actually started doing the work the yeah. ones who are actually working and the ones who weren't working there's two different perceptions being developed the one group that's is maintaining their original perception now the ones who realize that there's three not pulling their weight their perception changes right mm -hmm. they now realize okay well it doesn't seem like these guys are pulling their weight so the group's not actually six 
Yeah. The group's actually three. Well, it has boiled down to three. Right. There's also situations where people walk into groups and they already see their partners as incompetent. They already perceive them as that. Whether those partners or those group members, right, are actually incompetent or not is irrelevant. Right. Because, again, perception is there. They walk into the group. You have certain people who may walk into a team and not view it as a team. Right? They view it as, I'm going to do whatever I want. Everyone here is not going to do a good job. And then they overcompensate. Right? right. Now, this is, again, social compensation. Now, social compensation can help a group's productivity increase, but it may not necessarily always do that either. So, you have social loafing that typically, right, results in lower um, efficiency. And then you have social compensation that typically results in uh, fixing that problem, but it may not always. Right. And, you know, again, when I apply, like, say, to social compensation to mm -hmm. the Muslim Ummah, it, again, makes sense of what was going on, right? Like, take during the time of the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You had the, the companions, and then you had the hypocrites, yeah. right? They're going to war. They're, they're doing a lot of things where they have to work as a group. And there was no loss of quality during that time in all the things that they were doing, mm -hmm. right? And the hypocrites were doing exactly what, they, what, what they're described to be doing. They're hypocrites. So they would go. They would not pull in their weight. They would pull back. They would leave, yeah. you know? Like, but the quality of the Muslims during that time was, again, enough to deal with that to the point where, like, an army of, like, 300 Muslims can go up against an army of, like, a thousand or twelve hundred enemies <laughs> and they would wipe the floor with them mm -hmm. you know like the the number didn't matter because this three the quality of this 300 mind you within that 300 they're hypocrites so it's not actually just 300 it's probably like 200 or right. say 250 right right the quality of them the compensation that's going on there and 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 they ended up fulfilling the task or even now if we look at the current amma if you look at Da'i, right, we have over a million Muslims. I'm just going to throw out, uh, not, I don't know the exact number, but let's just say we have about a million Muslims. Out of that million Muslims, who all of us have been tasked with Da'wah. What do you mean a million Muslims? I'm just giving a number. I'm not giving an exact In total, number. you mean? Right. Oh, there's way more than that. Yeah, I know. I'm just giving a number just for simplicity. Okay. So let's say we have a million Muslims right now, right? Out of that million Muslims, we might have... 100, 200, 300 that are actually doing da'wah even though the entire Muslim ummah has been given the task to give da'wah yet the, the religion is growing right? so we see the result, the result is that the religion is still growing, it's still the fastest growing religion, but not everybody is pulling their weight, what we have here is social compensation because the ones who are doing it are do putting in extra effort to overcome the lack of effort being made on the other side yeah. you know and of course we don't know everybody's situation i mean it's good that you pointed it out that we don't know everybody's situation but i mean in reality when you actually look to see how many da'i the muslims have it's not nearly the number of muslims that we have you okay, know makes sense. so the reality is yeah we don't know everybody's we don't know why they're not pulling their weight but at the end of the day they're not i know i'm just my point is you have to be careful how you speak right to be just to other people. Right, definitely. You know. Okay, so um, overall, it's been a super duper interesting topic. Um, and before we close, I just wanted to give a few real life applications that I thought of. Um, one of them was, of course, the workplace. Mm -hmm. Um, in the workplace, we always have to work in teams. With post-COVID happening, uh, technological advances have just skyrocketed. Right. Um, and we are not only separated now by, by our personalities, our dispositions, and our cultural um, factors, we're also separated now, literally. <laughs> um, of course, places are starting to open back up. But because of COVID, things have changed. Technology has definitely advanced. Um, there's the expectation that technological proficiency is going to be one of the number one skills when it comes to working in the next several years. Um, just because of the fact that A, pandemic's not necessarily over. B, we have COVID continuously evolving. But C, because they found that it just helps. 
it just works right yeah, yeah. Um, and so because of this plus the fact that in nowadays businesses and organizations things are highly highly complex compared to the way they used to be um, we have to figure out ways to work with each other uh, across areas right um, so we're like globally dispersed we have to figure out ways to work with each other in all different areas um, but we also have to work in much bigger teams okay right. um, because the tasks are so complex right. um, so some of the recommendations some of the applications that you guys can take whether you're a business owner you're a manager or you're even just part of a team um, is to number one break your teams up into smaller parts um, and number two put more responsibility on the social loafers now this doesn't mean put more responsibility as in more tasks this means put make them feel a little bit more responsible in the sense of the group underperforming be open and honest with them communicate with them and let them know look because of your performance <laughs> the group is underperforming and they have to now hold more responsibility mm. it's not it's 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 the um it's shifting the perception non-physical per, uh, responsibility i'm not talking about giving them more tasks you're just gonna you know mess yourself up All right but you need um, to change their perception into right. understanding that Exactly. You need to work now on changing that perception. And of course, team building works really, really well where you come and you have, you teach the perceptions that you want each team member to hold or to hold as a group. Mm -hmm. Open, honest communication is the best thing that you could do in general for any business, for anyone, for any relationship at all, at all, at all, at all. It's like the first step is the foundation, mm -hmm. right? Which brings me into the family unit, because immediately, even though I'm studying this for a business course, <laughs> um, and it's highly interesting when I apply it to the to the work field, I can't help but think about families because my background is in psychology. But besides that, most of us are in family units, and our family unit is our core. Before we leave the house to go to work every morning or log into Zoom or whatever it is that we're doing for work. We're with our families, and we're with our families at the end of the night. Um, and this, of course, applies to people that have families, right? Because I'm not making the assumption that everyone has a family with them. Mm. But um, a lot of the time, we may, let's say, we may um, be in a relationship. Social loafing happens in relationships, people, especially if you have kids. It happens a lot. There are mothers out there who are are depressed. Some some want to die. Some just can't take it anymore. Some resort to doing things a stuck for a lot that maybe they're not supposed to be doing. And of course, fathers may end up in this position as well. And even if there are no kids involved, the social loafing that happens in relationships is ridiculous. Mm. Um, and sorry to use such a harsh harsh word but it's 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 hard it's painful now it it's now it's moved beyond loss of efficiency in the home as a as a as a unit okay but it also causes hurt feelings it also causes a uh, a feeling of lack of appreciation and those kinds of things you know mm. when you're trying to depend on your partner you have a partner when you get married you have a partner right and you're trying to depend on them and they're supposed to be pulling their weight and for whatever reason maybe they're on their phone um you know they just won't take out the trash if that's part of what they're supposed to be doing maybe you have a kid and they decide that they're not going to spend any time with the kid um or you know etc 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 and this also applies to if you have kids too let's say you have a group of kids and then you're like everybody you know clean up the room there's always going to be probably that one kid sitting in the corner trying to avoid doing anything maybe they're on their phone or something right mm. So we have to look at our lives, realistically speaking. And interestingly enough, marriage is a pair. <laughs> it's like the ultimate, um, well, I mean, unless you have more than one wife. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> but the point is, well, even if you have more than one wife, it's not like you're just with everybody all at the same time. Honestly, it happens in pairs. Right. So it's like the ultimate combination of strength you get what i'm saying so when we all just decide that we're going to social loaf all we're doing is making ourselves weak and musa's talking about the ummah right the ummah starts in your home 
And if you're married, it starts in that marriage. Right. That's where it starts. You know? You were right. gonna say something. You looked like it. Yeah, I mean it's it's interesting because the effects of the Ringelman show that like and when you get to two you have like ninety percent. But mm-hmm. in today's day if I mean you have pairs, couples everywhere, but the efficiency isn't isn't matching, right? Right. Like I would say that the the couple is the or today's couple I would say, because I don't think it was always like this. Mm -hmm. Um, Today's couple is like the epitome of uh, a counterexample. Yes. Right? And, you know, we still see that one. Mm -hmm. That effect at 1%, we do see, or the of one individual, we see. One individual is expected to be putting in 100% of the effort. When you have single moms or single dads, they put in 100% of the effort because there's no one else to rely on. But now, for some reason, when it comes to the relationship... You have two people in there, and one's not pulling their weight. One is still putting in a hundred percent, one is or close to a hundred percent, right? And the other one is social is compensation, right? You know that there goes that social compensation effect happening within the pair, and you know it. It, it I think it has a lot to do with perception. Yes, I mean all of this has to do with perception, but like at least in the family unit, especially when you have a pair one is kind of expected to do more than the other Mm -hmm. you know we kind of the social norms that everybody carry the stereotypes that everybody carry even just the evidence of like say single moms who are like super moms doing everything a lot of times the dads see that and they just think well that's the role of the woman yeah you know so they walk in with the perception of social loafing it's Mm -hmm. not like the the task was distributed and both were on the same page in the beginning and then you know they started at an equal level and then toned down to to balance itself out it was thrown off right from the get-go yeah you know so those are predispositions that people are walking in with right with like pre-perceptions right and those predispositions is probably something that the researchers who were studying ringelman in the past and even today probably aren't really taking into account no well those are those extraneous factors those are the limitations of the studies i mean those are stated as limitations literally if you read these research studies the limitations that they present are those. Right, and I imagine there's no way to... Necessarily factor that in. Right. Right. So... Because that's not necessarily a quantitative thing. Right. It's not really um, empirical. Right. Yeah. yeah. All right, guys. So, we hope that you enjoyed this big talk. Um, and I really hope that you guys learned something. And, of course, we always love and enjoy feedback, whether it is publicly or privately. Um, And one last thing that I'd like to offer is if you are someone that listens to our talks and you feel like it may be of some benefit to you, you can always reach out to us in case you need any help. Mm. Yeah, Yeah. definitely. Okay, well, uh, with that, we're going to go ahead and close out. Thank you for tuning into big talks (laughs) because we hate small talk thanks